Well, we're just going to look at, uh, since Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, again, and this is the first couple days of his Prime Ministership. You know, the Speaker, the election, and wow, how things have changed. Much, much different from 2015. It looks like it was from like decades ago. Check it out. Thanks for watching. When we come back next week, I will be uh, doing my response to the speech from the throne. It may not be quite so sunny as what we've heard on the other side, but I look forward to that. <laughs> to that to that end, Mr. Speaker, and what everyone has been waiting for, I move, seconded by the Deputy Leader of the Official Opposition, the member from Lac Saint-Jean, that the debate be now adjourned. <laughs> Yeah, this is a throwback 2015 Parliament. Get excited and enjoy the difference. Honorable members, pursuant to Standing Order 3, I invite to Mr. Louis Plamondon, member for the Electoral District of Beconcourt, Nicolas Sorel, to take the chair as the member presiding over the election of the Speaker. This is the third time that I have the honor to be in this seat, and I'm really quite liking it, in fact. And with such a warm welcome, I should have run for this position myself. Just to give you a little bit of contrast, this was from this year. He's going to quell this crazy talk about the Bank of Canada wading into policy that he has responsibility for and keeping inflation at 2%. Yeah. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, over the past weeks, what have we seen from the Conservatives telling Canadians that the f problems they're facing with increased affordability, uh, increased prices on everything, difficulty buying gas, difficulty buying computers, they, they shrugged and said, oh, it's just inflation. Well, it's not just inflation, Mr. Speaker. It is a focus that we have to have to continue to invest in Canadians. While they play word games, we are focused on delivering on housing, delivering on child care, delivering on the support that cheap political games. Order! Order! The Honourable Member for... The government is committed to providing greater security and opportunity for Canadians. Canadians are open, accepting, and generous people. We know that helping those in need strengthens our communities and makes them safer, more prosperous places to live. The government will strengthen its relationship with allies, especially with our closest friend and partner, the United States. Internationally, the government will focus its development assistance on helping the world's poorest and most vulnerable. To contribute to greater peace throughout the world, the government will renew Canada's commitment to United Nations peacekeeping operations and will continue to work with its allies in the fight against terrorism. To keep Canadians safe and be ready to respond when needed, the government will launch an open and transparent process to review existing defence capabilities and will invest in building a leaner, more agile, better equipped that the government will run deficits of 12 billion over and above the promised 10 billion yearly deficit. So Canadians, Canadians need to have an open and transparent account of exactly what this government will spend. And Mr. Spirit, or Mr. Speaker, 
In the spirit of openness and transparency, will the honourable member please outline the government's plan so Canadians will know exactly how much they will be paying in extra and additional taxes? Honourable yeah. 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 Member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First, I would like to congratulate my colleague on her election. <laughs> Second, our government was given a clear mandate to invest in our country, and that we plan to do. We will be decreasing taxes for the middle class, and we will also be open and transparent with our spending. In the weeks to come, you will see the budget unfold, and you will have answers to some of those questions, <clears throat> but tax cuts will be decreased. Thank you. Just inflation. Misrepresenting the inflation crisis. Just in, just inflation. Imagine. It's just inflation. We'll imagine. It's just inflation. We'll to have people's backs. What the hell was he thinking? He shrugged and said, "Oh, it's just inflation." It's just in, just in. Since November 4th, it has been clear that we've ramped down our contributions. The Prime Minister has told our allies that we will be pulling out our CF-18s, the fight against ISIS, that President Obama called, of course, the cult of death. And Mr. Speaker, I have to say that while on the international stage we saw leaders of the Western world come together, coalescing around the fight against ISIS, and the impression that was left with Canadians and the international community was that our Prime Minister was consumed with taking selfies. Mm -hmm. I mention this because it was mentioned to me many times by constituents, and that was the impression left. Not that we have a leader that is going to step up and stand resolutely shoulder to shoulder with our allies, but one that consistently consistently reminded Canadians of an election promise, even after the attacks in Paris and Beirut. The Prime Minister has offered no sensible argument for pulling our Air Force out of this fight, because frankly there isn't one. Meanwhile, President Obama made clear last evening the reasons for remaining part of the bombing mission are clear and unambiguous. So it's not too late for the Prime Minister to change course. The reality is, the reality is, is when we talk about Canada's new approach to fighting ISIS, Canada isn't back. Canada is backing away. So our offer stands, Mr. Speaker, should this government change its position and allow our Air Force to continue bombing ISIS along with our allies, it would have our full support. And it's possible when government puts the interests of Canadians at the very heart of its concerns and its plan. We are committed to delivering real change in the way that government works. It means setting a higher bar for openness and transparency, something needed if this House is to regain the confidence and trust of Canadians. One thing is very clear. We won't be able to meet the challenges we're facing from growing our economy to responding to the threat of climate change to keeping our citizens and our communities safe unless we have Canadians in our corner. People want a government that is honest and open, transparent and accountable, and relentlessly focused on those that, is exi that it exists to serve. We will be that government. Canadians, Canadians want a government that acts honorably, 
and treats all others with respect, both inside and outside this House, we will be that government. Canadians are tired of the cynicism that has been a feature for far too long of federal politics. They're willing to trust this new government, but on one condition. If we want Canadians to trust their government, government must trust Canadians. Mr. Speaker, every day we will work hard to gain and keep Canadians' trust. This Parliament belongs to Canadians, and we must constantly show that the voices of all Canadians matter. Third, we are going to keep proving to Canadians and the rest of the world that a healthy, clean environment and a strong economy go hand in hand. That is true for investing in clean energies, and that's what we're determined to do. But it's also true when it comes to climate change, because the global climate is not only a huge challenge, it's also a historic opportunity. We have an opportunity to build a truly sustainable economy, an economy that's based on clean energy, green infrastructure, and green jobs. And hundreds of thousands of good jobs on the table for the countries that get this right. And as I told our international and domestic partners in Paris last week, Building a clean economy will create growth, not sacrifice. <laughs> Our ambition can't end with making sure that Canada makes the most of a challenging situation. As we know, the atmosphere doesn't care where carbon was emitted. That's why we will invest 2.65 billion dollars over the next five years to help the developing world grow in a cleaner, more sustainable way. And here at home, and here at home, we will protect the environment with new environmental assessment processes, respect for science and scientists, and more public input, including greater engagement and respect for Indigenous peoples. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Canadians are smart, practical people. They don't expect us to solve all the world's problems. All they ask is that Canada do its part and lead by example when it comes to protecting the environment and growing the economy. Our government will do just that. Fourth, we will continue to work with Canadians to build a more peaceful and prosperous country, one that is strong not in spite of our differences, but because of them. Canada's success, culturally, politically, economically, proves that diversity and inclusion work. But we still have much more work to do. For Indigenous peoples, Life in Canada has not been, and is not today, easy, equitable, or fair. Our history also shows that too often, those who choose, chose to come to Canada and build their lives here have been treated with indifference or worse. And some Canadians who were born here have, at times, been the target of hateful words and deeds, simply because they look different, speak a different language, choose to wear different clothes, or practice a different faith. Mr. Speaker, painful as that may be, we need to acknowledge these truths. We are not well served by ignorance. At the same time, <laughs> at the same time it's important to remember the Canadians are good and decent people, 
and against the warm hearts and welcoming spirit of Canadians, intolerance stands little chance. Because no amount of fear can distinguish the understanding that we're all in this together. No act of aggression can separate us from the deeply felt knowledge that wherever we come from, we are united in our struggles and in our dreams. Et tous les efforts and all efforts to make us closed will be in vain because when Canadians have a choice, like they had in the last election, they always reject attempts to pit them against each other. Mr. Speaker, it has been just over a month since our government took office. In that time, we have held bilateral talks with the leaders of all UN Security Council permanent members, the United States, the United Kingdom, Russia, France, and China. We've also represented Canada at four major international summits in Turkey, we met with the G20 leaders, in the Philippines with leaders of APEC nations, and in Malta with Commonwealth heads of government. Et la semaine dernière, and last week, the Premier of BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario and Quebec had joined our government to participate in the international talks on climate change in Paris. Alongside the leader of the First Nations, the leader of the NDP, and the conservative critic. We listened and we worked together. Personally, I enjoy the long hours, the difficult times, and the long nights. And it's the same for all members in this house, because this was the reason we were sent here. Nelson Mandela, who said that he discovered that after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. I have no doubt that we will encounter many such hills in the years ahead. But I also know that our success or failure as a government will be measured in more than recorded yeas and nays. We will succeed when we deliver an economy that works for the middle class, when we make government open and transparent by default, when we combine for all Canadians a clean environment, and a strong economy. We will succeed when we affirm that Canada is a country strengthened by diversity, when we realize greater security and opportunity for Canada and for the world. Mr. Speaker, those are the things that matter most to Canadians. That is the real change they desire and deserve. When we asked them the question, Canadians didn't want to just uh, go with what was good enough, but they rejected the idea that it wasn't possible to do more because 